Welcome, everyone, to the Twin City Community Church Podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Chris Rodriguez. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm excited about this new podcast because there's a lot going on. And uh, I think that there are so many issues going on in the world to where it takes a multitude of people to be able to address these things. And I'm grateful for the local church, the different churches and the different communities. But for those who don't know me, once again, I'm Chris Rodriguez, pastor at Twin City Community Church. And uh, I just want you guys to know that uh, I know there are uh, many of you who remember me when I was younger. Um, they used to call me Little Chris. And that's what I'm known for in the Rosenberg, Richmond, Needville surrounding areas. Um, I was a break dancer back then. And that's how a lot of people knew me. Uh, so if you don't recognize me now, if I was to stand up, you'd say, oh, that's little Chris. Cause my height, you know, about five foot two and a half. I put five foot four, five, five on my driver's license, you know, you know, give myself a couple more inches, but, uh, I'm, uh, here I am now. I mean, I was living a life that wasn't, uh, um, that wasn't good. I was living a life that was so separated from God. Um, uh, but in the nineties, the Lord brought me, um, into his presence and uh, brought the gospel to me. And I heard it, I believed it, I received it, confessed it, and uh, re believed it with all my heart that Jesus Christ um, came, lived, died the perfect life for me, um, died in my place, was buried for me, and rose for me, resurrected for me. I believe that. And I became born again, became a child of God. Hard for many of my friends in the past um to believe and to understand but it's true it's what happened um and so i've been ministering and preaching at uh twin city community church um that started in uh may of uh may 19th of 2019 we started uh, with just a few of us and now we've grown and we've uh, moved out of our house into a second location and then we've moved that second location we are now um having our services on Sunday mornings uh, at uh, Wessendorf Middle School, 5201 Mustang Avenue in Rosenberg. Um, on Sunday mornings at 11, doors open at 1015, free to come. We have snacks and stuff in the morning, coffee and stuff, and everyone's welcome. We're a non-denominational church. Our beliefs are on our website at TwinCityCommunityChurch.org. Um, I'm glad that you're with me today. Um, I, I have a topic that I want to talk about today to inaugurate um, this first uh, Twin City Community Church podcast. And the topic uh, that we have is actually one that um, I really wasn't sure I was going to take the time to go in this direction. But this week at one of our weekly Bible studies, because although we only have one uh, service at the Wessendorf location on Sunday mornings at 11. We do have three Bible studies throughout the week, one in Missouri City, and uh, uh, that one's on Tuesdays at 7, one in Wallace. Uh, we have that one uh, at um, 7 o'clock as well on Wednesdays, and then on Friday nights at 7, we have a Bible study in Rosenberg it, that switches uh, from two locations. So I'm teaching the Word of God four times a week at times if one of our other leaders are not teaching. But um, I'm grateful for everything that God is doing. And uh, at the study we had this past Tuesday, our, uh, one of the young adults um, in our young adults group had a question that uh, had us talking until um, the Bible study was over at about 10 
uh, o'clock uh, because of questions and everything. But I ended up staying there at this family's house until like 2.30 in the morning, uh, answering all kinds of questions because these young adults are fired up. They're excited. They're ready to get baptized. Uh, they've already been baptized in the spirit, have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so this, these questions they had were very important. But one question that stood out that I feel is very important to answer. And I know that there are people who live in Rosemary, Richmond, who know I'm the pastor of Twin City Community Church, but who think uh, different of me. They may think that my answer for this question on, is it okay for a Christian to get tattoos? Is it sinful? They may think they know what my answer is already because they've heard me preach. They know what my stances are according to living a life um, of holiness, living a life uh, sanctified through the spirit where we're allowing God to change us each and every day. But one thing we need to remember, one thing that's our motto at Twin City Community Church is that we will never be sinless. But because we've been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and have the blessing of the word of God to teach us the will of God, we may never be sinless while we're on earth. But because we're changed and transformed, um, we will begin to sin less in this world. So we should be changing and growing, you know, more and more um, as we're believers and staying in God's word and staying in a close relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I want to get into study because I think it's very um, relevant for today. Now, there are many other topics I'm going to pick up. I'm, I'm going to talk about the Pope. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the the situation in Israel. I'm going to talk about um, families, family life, pastoral, uh, uh, you know, responsibilities. I'm going to talk about the church. I'm going to talk about the different doctrines of Christianity. We're going to do this and continue this until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And I'm going to have fun and enjoy doing it. And we're going to do this, though, with an attempt to rightly divide God's word. Um, being a, um, a man of God that I am now, I, I know that there are many different churches and denominations and different um, religious institutions and organizations that teach different things, even though we have the same Bible. But the reason that's done is because many have stuck to old traditions. Um, for instance, there are many people um, actually who teach certain things because they teach things that were um, given or taught way before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, which are the manuscripts, over 25,000 manuscripts of the Hebrew and Greek uh, interpretations of the New Testament. And so there's uh, these revelations like the, the original truths, the original understanding and meanings of doctrine or scripture, um, which... Um, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Assemblies of God or uh, United Pentecostals have once held, Baptists have once held, that once these um, these writings were found, these manuscripts were found, it changes the ball game. Now that when you see it in, in its original context, we know the meanings now of certain words and it changes the, the understanding of, you know, what the Word of God says now. <clears throat> and so the Word of God has always meant the same thing from the moment that it was written from the, the old Hebrew writings uh, all the way through the Aramaic and Greek writings that we have for the New Testament as well. They've always been the same. They've just been looked at or interpreted different. But once we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, once they were, they were revealed, um, we now have the ability to know exactly and to have exactly one interpretation of the scripture, even though we have different denominations. Everyone should be seeing and reading and interpreting it the same way. But when you're taught something without knowing the original truth or the in original intention, we should be saying and meaning what the Holy Ghost and what the, the writers, the apostles and prophets meant when they wrote it. Amen. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stick to that tradition um, as a, a body of Christ, as a local church here at Twin City Community Church. And so I want to take this topic on, and I want to begin with the passage that, um, without revealing what I believe right now, but trust me, please stick around, watch this whole lesson, or honestly, later, you'll be able to fast forward when you're showing someone else, my answer is really going to be towards the end. It really is. And so uh, I'd like for you to um, hang in there with me in order for you to gain some insight 
to this topic. Um, let's dive into the Word of God so we can get as close to the, the truth as possible. And that's what we're desiring to do today, okay? So thank you for joining me once again. In Leviticus, this passage is always used to teach that um, this, there's the pros and the cons that we might talk about tonight and or today. And many people use verse 28 of Leviticus 19 to say, You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Uh, one of the issues we have with that, that I have with that, and many scholars and other teachers in the world have with this, is that a lot of scriptures are taken out of context. First of all, one of the reasons that um, God did not want for the nation of Israel to cut themselves or to put tattoos on their bodies for the nation of Israel. Remember, I'm not giving my answer yet. But one of the reasons he wanted them to do it, not to do it was because that was uh, something that pagan uh, countries did or pagan uh, you know, groups and, uh, you know, uh, sex and like sex, S-E-C-T-S, -E um, tribes, they used to do this. Uh, they would worship false gods, false idols, and they would take the image of that false god and idol and they would tattoo it, mark it on their body to reveal who their god was. But you see, the nation of Israel was made in the image of God. So the entirety of their body resembled an who God was because of their life and their actions, because we know that it's not just what you say, it's how you live. It's what you do that reveals who your God is and reveals your unity with him and the genuineness of your faith um, in the God that you say you serve. And so God didn't want them marking their bodies and cutting themselves like other, you know, pagan uh, nationalities did, because that was their way of worshiping their God. And he said, I am the Lord, meaning if you mark yourself with a tattoo like they do, then you're saying that the image of that tattoo on you is your God, your Lord. Your, that's a representation of who you worship. So don't do it because I am your Lord. And another thing I want to say about that is that in verse 26, there's things like it says, uh, you shall not eat anything with blood nor practice divination or soothsaying. Okay, so then that would mean in today's modern day, I couldn't eat a very rare steak like I like to have them because it's got blood in it, right? Well, you'll have some people who um, their faith is is weak or they, they stand on something like that. That's what they believe. You'll have those kinds, but for um, the sake of not offending them, you'll see what the Word of God teaches us about that, what to do in those situations, okay? It also goes on to say, um, in verse 27, you shall not round off the side of the side growth of your heads, nor harm the edges of your beard. So um, you're saying we can't cut our beards or shave now anymore. So that's what I mean by people taking things out of context, because we no longer live under in bondage to the old law uh, because Jesus came not to abolish the old law, but to satisfy it perfectly. Jesus lived out the law of the Old Testament perfectly because that's one thing that we couldn't do we fall short of the glory of god we we fell short of that standard we couldn't meet the requirements um and the standards that god had for us and because we'd never be able to satisfy every law we were always going to fall short of the glory of god and therefore we'd never really 100 percent be right with god and so that's why jesus had to come he didn't abolish the law he fulfilled Build the law. Amen. And we'll see that in our study today. But that was um, what I wanted you to see uh, in accordance to this passage here. And so I want you to just follow along with me to the next passage, if you would, to um, let's start in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. In Romans 10, um, verse 4, we want to see what the apostle Paul is teaching us and what he's showing us. In verse 10, remember our question, is it okay for Christians to get a tattoo? Now that they are Christians, we're not talking about, did you come to Christ with tattoos? That's not the question. The question is, is it okay for a Christian to get a tattoo for a born-again child of God, spirit-filled, um, Christ-led, Holy Ghost-led, you know, spirit-driven, uh, new creation in God? Is it okay for that person to get a tattoo and um we're trying to answer that question we're going to do the best that we can today okay in romans chapter 10 verse 4 the apostle paul writes 
For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's what I was just saying. Christ is the end of the law. We no longer have to satisfy the perfect law. We can shave our beards now. We can eat pork. We can, you know, eat what we want to eat. We'll see that in a minute. There are many things that we can do. Christ lived all that out perfectly for us. We don't have to worry about that anymore. So it says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So what makes us right with God? Not what I don't eat, not what I don't do, but what I did do. What is that? Believe in Jesus Christ. That makes me right with God. If you believe that, say amen. Um, in Galatians chapter 3, let's turn there, beginning in verse 23. Let's read that. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Here's what we see, the Apostle Paul writing again to the church in Galatia. He says, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The law was given to mankind through the nation of Israel so we could see that we would always fall short. The commandments were given to us we would never be able to live up to them. And, and that, would, that was why there was a burden on the hearts of the nation of Israel, of the men and women, the kings and everyone, uh, to cry out to God for mercy and grace because it was the, the, the law was there to show us that we needed God. We needed God. And it was a tutor to teach us how to depend on God. Because as long as we were human and as long as we had the laws, we'd never be able to satisfy them ever once and for all. That's why Jesus had to come. Only he could satisfy them once and for all. Jesus came to live the perfect life, to die the death that I was needing to die for the wages of sin was death. I should have died, but he died my death. And Jesus not only died, but he was buried. I should have been buried. But then after Jesus was buried, he rose again from the grave. Jesus' resurrection is my resurrection. Because he rose and lives I'm going to rise and live again when I die. Amen. Hallelujah. And praise God for that. And looking at verse 24 again of Galatians 3. For therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may, it says, be justified by faith. I'm justified by faith, not by what I do. The only do or action thing I had to do was believe in Jesus Christ. He said that to the multitudes in John chapter 7, verse 24 to 26. They said, what was, must we do um, to work the works of the Father for salvation? Jesus said, believe in the one in whom he sent. That's it. That's what you do. And so I know there's more. Some people might question, oh, that's it. All you got to do is believe and then I can live any way I want. That's not what I'm saying. That's not the topic today. So don't ask that question now. But Pastor Chris at Twin City, he's going to answer that question. That's going to come up. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about salvation. Can you lose it? Or is it for, is it eternal? What is salvation? We'll talk about that in the future. But today we're talking about, is it okay for a Christian, a born again, spirit filled, spirit led, Christ saved person? Are they allowed to get a tattoo? That's what we're talking about today. In the last verse of Galatians 3, verse 25, it says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We don't need the Old Testament law anymore. Why? Because everything pertaining to the law is written on our hearts. We now have a morality that is sensitive to the will of God that keeps us in line with God in order to live in a manner that pleases God. And so I don't have to look at the law to know what pleases God. In my heart, my conscience convicts me because the Holy Spirit who is in me convicts me when my my person, me, the Chris, who is, who's flesh and, and a spirit, and, and this person, not the new person, but this person, when this person wants to do something that is sinful or goes against the will of God, the Holy Ghost in me convicts me not to do it. At least that's the image we had where there was an angel on one shoulder and the devil on another shoulder, right? We get that image, but it's not an angel and the devil. It's actually my flesh Yes, the devil may be tempting, but it's the Holy Spirit, Christ leading, speaking to us within our inner man to lead and guide us, amen, to do what pleases the Father. So we are justified by faith, amen. 
And so I want us to see this as well in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what we see. Speaking of our topic, it says in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity or the, 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 the division, the war that we had with God, we were enemies of God. It says, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Jesus came to help us to be at peace, not only with God, but with mankind. But the main objective of Christ was to lead us to the Father, to save us, to protect us from the wrath and the judgment of the Father that is to come. When people say, uh, are you saved? What are they saying? Are you saved from the wrath and the judgment of God? God, in essence, is trying to save us from himself. He's trying to save us from his judgment. He's that merciful and loving and kind of like, look, I'm about to, to lay the hammer down and I'm trying to tell you, get out of the way. There, he doesn't want friendly fire. <clears throat> he wants us to, to, by his mercy and by his grace, to be saved and have a right relationship with him. And the way he accomplished that was through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's look at this real quick. The note says, we must be careful when interpreting the word of God, because what we're talking about is tattoos and, and other things. We're going to talk about other things in the mix of this conversation, drinking and other stuff like that. But we got to be careful because we must be careful when interpreting the word of God, just because the word of God is silent on specific activity. That does not necessarily mean that God approves of the activity, meaning just because it doesn't mention that um, that women shouldn't abort children, it doesn't mean it just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean that God approves of it. OK, just because in the Bible it doesn't say that um, we can't behead babies like was just done in Israel, you know, which was horrible, horrible act of the Palestinian mob, not all Palestinians, but that was done against, you know, Israeli babies. Um, that act, just because it doesn't say you cannot behead babies in the Bible doesn't mean that God approves of that activity. So we got to be careful, you know, that just because some things are silent, you know, that we don't run with it and say, oh, it doesn't mention it so I can do it. You know, a lot of people who want to uh, be approved um, in society or, or who want to justify themselves will use silent arguments to say that it's OK because God doesn't mention it in the word. Amen. And that's what we need to be careful for, not to make decisions unwisely. Amen. So let's look at this next passage in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. In Revelation 19, verse 16, here's what the word of God says. Let's look at this. Beginning in chapter 19, those who say, or because we're talking about the pros and cons, I haven't given my stance yet. I haven't said what I what I personally believe based on my uh, study in God's word over the last couple of decades, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to get there. But uh, right now I'm saying that many people say, um, as I read in Leviticus 19, that you can't have tattoos and people use Revelation 19 to say you can have tattoos. And so let's look at what um, Revelation 19 verse 16 actually says. Verse 16 actually says, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, just because <clears throat> Jesus has a name on his thigh, remember the argument in silence? It, does, it, didn't, it doesn't mean that just because he has a name on his thigh that it's a tattoo. It could, he could be, it says he has a robe on and that name could be on a sash or embroidered or somehow on his robe. Like someone could be looking at me and say, you know, Pastor Chris has a cross on his chest, which you see the Twin City Community Church logo on his chest. And that is very well true. But that doesn't mean that it's tattooed on my chest. It means that I have a shirt on and on this shirt is the, the logo of Twin City Community Church. And I'm wearing it and it's on or over my chest. So we got to be careful not to use the argument of silence, okay? And not to be so quick to want, you know, to justify what we believe and misinterpret and misquote another scripture, amen? So let's go to the next passage that we have here 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you'll turn with me there to um, specifically in 1 Corinthians 10, let's go to verse 23. So in verse 23, here's what the word of God says. All things are lawful, he says, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. You hear what it says? It says, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor, which means even though I have freedom to do something, I shouldn't do it for the sake of my neighbor or, or the lost in the world. Let's keep reading. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are, are things edify. Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in a meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. He says, verse 28, but, everybody say but, but if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. So if, if I'm free to eat that food, but if a brother says, bro, don't, you know, we don't eat that. You shouldn't eat that, man. Don't eat it. I'm not going to say, bro, you do you and, and I do me, bro. Don't be so super religious. You ain't going to put your, your religiosity on me. What did Paul just say? For the sake of the brother, don't do it. If it's going to offend someone, don't do it. Now, we're not saying, you know, there's going to be people who everything offends them. Wearing a hat, wearing a grill, you know, or wearing skinny jeans, whatever. We got to use wisdom in all these decisions. But, you know, the basic fundamental principle that the Apostle Paul is making is that we got to be considerate of those who may be offended by what we do. Because remember, I'm going to start laying it down right now. Our main objective is not to always worry about our own needs, our own desires, and always care about our own self to be happy. We got our main objective is to lead the lost to Christ. That's our main objective. So if what we're going to do is going to offend somebody. We take the high road and don't offend them because our goal is to build them up or to lead them to Christ if they're lost. It, our life doesn't belong to us no more. We're going to see that in a minute. We don't, we don't live for ourselves. We live to glorify God. That is our goal. Let's keep reading. Um, we're on verse um, 29. I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another man's conscience? Verse 30. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? He's making the argument to not do what most Christians in today's modern, you know, culture of Christianity do. They say, hey, man, don't don't be bringing your religion on me, bro. You know, if I'm a chew gum, I'm a chew gum. If the women want to wear makeup, let them wear makeup. He said, look, don't have that attitude because you might say that. Why do I got to not do something? Because you're weak, because you're considering others more than yourself. Have you thought about that? It's not about you. It's about others. It's about others. We're praying that they would grow, but we're to take, those of us who are mature, we're to take the high road, amen, because we are mature in the Lord. Let's look at the next verse in verse 31. He says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That is my point tonight. Whatever it is you're wanting to do, you must consider it. Is it going to glorify God? Is God ultimately going to be glorified. That is the key. That is the goal. Not, is it going to make you happy? Is it going to satisfy your desires? Is it going to satisfy your needs? That's not the goal. The goal is, is Christ going to be glorified? Or are we going to be able to edify and build up? Are we going to be able to lead others to Christ? That is the objective. Let's keep reading. In verse 32, it gets even better. It says, no offense either to Jews, because many Jews hadn't come to Christ yet. So if they didn't want you to eat pork around them when you were going to witness to them, then don't eat pork. Then he says, or he says, give no offense to the Greeks. You know, if there was something like the Greeks detested the Jews. Okay, if they don't want you to t talk to them about your Jewishness, you know, if you were a Jew, or to talk about how God brought salvation through the Jews, if they didn't want to hear that, then find another way to share the gospel with them. 
Don't offend them for the sake of giving them the gospel. Amen. He says, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things. Why? Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many. Why? What's the big picture? What is the end? So that they may be saved. Man, we've got liberty and freedom to do many things, but we need to use wisdom not to do them because we need to consider their salvation or building them up. Our whole job is to either build people up or lead the lost to Christ. Now, I want to say this to single men and women now that I have this opportunity. Most of the time in today's modern culture of Christianity, many men and women will meet a man or a woman of the opposite sex. They will think that their feelings are determining what their main objective is. And this woman will find a lost man and think that she's led of God to clean this man up to be her husband. Christ isn't leading you to the man to make him your husband. Christ is leading you to lead the lost man to him. And if Christ chooses to give that man to you, then you can have the man. But he's not there for your taking. Don't make the objective for your selfish gain. Likewise for the man. Don't minister to that woman because you want her to be your wife. You want her to be yours. Minister to her because you want her to belong to Christ. And if she's born again, she may find you handsome and, and interesting. And then maybe Christ will allow you to have a relationship. Or if you really are a, a shady and a wishy-washy Christian man, once she becomes born again, she'll see right through you. <laughs> so it's either or, but most of all, do not try to reach people for your own selfish reasons. Our main objective is to build people up for Christ or lead them to Christ for salvation. Amen. So Paul says in verse 33 again, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. We got that? That's the whole goal of every decision. And what are we talking about? Without giving you my answer, I haven't given it to you yet. So don't assume you know what I mean or what, what my answer is just because of the way I'm talking. All I'm doing is reading scripture. That's all I'm doing right now. I haven't given you my stance on whether or not it's okay for a Christian to get a tattoo or whether or not answering a question isn't sinful. I haven't answered that completely yet, but I am giving you principles on what to look for and how to make decisions. Amen. So let's look at something else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, here's what we see. In chapter 9, beginning in verse 19, the Word of God says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. What's Paul saying? I got freedom to do anything, but because when Christ saved me and brought me out of darkness and into his marvelous light, I am now just appointed to the main objective to build men up for Christ or to lead them to Christ. That's my main objective, that I may win more. And my job is not to be an offense or a stumbling block to anyone. We're going to see that in the scriptures as we read. It says here in the next passage, it says in verse 20, to the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though <clears throat> not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. What is he saying? He's, he's saying that I, I'm going to try to come to a level even to the atheist and to the non-believer. I'm going to try not to offend them. So just because they talk derogatory, use derogatory language, they're rude. The Word of God says as, as much as it's up to us in our power to be at peace with all men and women. Why? Because God may be ministering to someone and wanting them to come to him, even in their rebellion and in their anger and in their rage, right? They're kicking against the things of God. And, and it's not our job to, to push them further. It's our job to bring the gospel, to lead them to Christ or to build them up. Amen. Let's keep going. Look what he says in the next verse. In verse 22, he even goes as far as saying to those that are weak in their Christianity and weak in their faith. He says to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become 
all things to all men. Why? So that I may, by all means, save some. What's the goal? The objective, leading people to Christ. It's not about what your feelings are. It's not about you do you and I do me. Man, you better not have that attitude, woman or person of Christ. Do not have that attitude. Your job is not to be saved and live for yourself. Your job is to live for Christ. And what does it mean to live for Christ? Die to yourself. It's to give up your life in order to help people find their life in Christ. That's it. It's not to go out and make enemies when people disagree with us, but it is still to point out the truth. When someone's teaching a false gospel, we don't we don't accept their false gospel. That's different. We're talking about things that cause them to stumble to come to Christ. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Let's look at the next passage. Um, in verse 23, it says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. In verse um, 23, he says, look, you can't even be a partaker um, of the gospel if um, if your attitude is that you don't have the ability to uh, minister to somebody because you're clashing with them, then you know what? You're not able to be a fellow partaker of the gospel. Like the whole point and objective is to lead them to Christ. But if you're going to conflict because you're offended by their offense, like you, you can't handle that a weaker person doesn't want you to be drinking around them or something or smoking around it. Guess what? Don't do it. If you're going to cause someone to stumble, don't do it. Christianity, the life of Christianity is not about me and you. It's about leading the lost to Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're familiar with this area of Scripture, this passage of Scripture. If you read the Bible frequently, you know um, what 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is talking about. Let's start at verse 12. He says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. He says, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Basically, he's saying, you know, I can do certain things, but I shouldn't let anything master me. My master is Jesus Christ. I'm going to be, I'm allowing my heart to be led and bent based on what God wants and what his word says. I'm going to be obedient to him. Even if I really desire to do something, if I got to give it up for the sake of working with God to lead people to him, which is the most important thing and objective in the world, then that's what I'm going to do. Amen. Look at the next uh, verse in verse 19 down there. It says, do you not know that you, uh, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a, what does it say? You have been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. We must remember 100% that we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to God. Please, I'm telling you, I'll repeat it again later. Do not be the person who says you do you and I do me. You'll be pushing people away. The only time it's okay to say, listen, I'm going to stick to my guns on this because the word of God says, you know, this about doctrine. If it's about doctrine like salvation, then that's when we stand up. Hey, no, Jesus is the only way. Hey, no, you know, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, the Trinity. That's that's a true um, doctrine. That's a reality in the body of Christ. That's a reality in um, theology and in, in the teachings of Scripture that the, there's a Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All three are one. Amen. Three different persons, but one God. Amen. And so that's the point that we're making today. Don't make it all about you. Let's look at the next passage of Romans chapter 14. And this will be our big section in Romans chapter 14, um, beginning in verse 1. I think this is going to lead me now to reveal what my answer or my stance is pertaining to um, this topic. Um, is it okay for a Christian to get a tattoo? Now, I could have given you the answer in the beginning, but my job as a pastor, as a teacher, is to dissect the Word of God and to rightly divide it and to paint the whole picture. I'm not playing spiritual Pictionary where I'm just going to make a design and try to have you guess what, you know, the Word of God says or have, you know, a very uh, vague answer. Like, eh, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Well, you need to know what the Word of God says, and that's what we try to do here at Twin City Community Church. 
And so let's look at Romans 14, um, verse 1. Romans 14, verse 1 says, Now accept the one here, it says, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Meaning, don't look down on someone who's got weaker faith than you. The guy who says, bro, you shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, why are you drinking a glass of wine for dinner? You know, it's, if you know someone has, has been addicted to alcohol and stuff, man, you should be ashamed of that. You shouldn't be drinking in front of them. Maybe having a glass of wine, I'll tell you right now. My wife and I, when we go out to dinner, we want to have a glass of wine. We'll have a glass of wine. But we know that we aren't to become drunkards. We shouldn't be having multiple glasses in order to no longer be allowed to be led by the Holy Spirit. I should never be so consumed by something else that I'm not consumed and capable of being led by the Holy Spirit at all times. So even in my in my righteous anger, I can't allow it to become fleshly anger because I can be angry, but I cannot sin. Because then I'll be outside of the bounds of being led of the Holy Spirit in my anger. That'll turn into sin. Likewise, in, if, in my desire to have a, a glass of wine, which I think is okay to have biblically, I'll teach on that later, give reasons for that, which is we're going through some of it now. It's making the case, but you understand what I'm saying. If it calls, what I do causes someone to stumble, then I shouldn't do it at all. And he says, um, now accept the one who is weak in faith, not but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. I mean, he's giving the argument here for, um, he knew the argument was going to come between a vegan and those of us who are carnivores. <laughs> Boy, I love my steak. Man, you eat, man, I don't care what it is. I, if it's me, I'm going to eat it. But for the sake of my brother, who's a vegan, or my sister who's a vegan, or a teenager who's desiring, you know, going through something and, and, and has a free choice to choose to eat, you know, veggies. If it offends them that I'm eating meat, you know, it says that that may be their weak faith. I'm free to eat meat, but they can't impose what they're doing on me, and I can't impose what I'm doing on them. But... I can't offend them either. So if I'm a mature Christian, I take the high road. Amen. Let's look at the next verse in verse four. Who are you to judge the servant of another? It says to his own master, he stands. And it says for the Lord is able. He's because it says to his master, he stands or falls and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. It is true that the Lord is able to make him stand. That is very true. But we got to make sure and understand that uh, just because we know that we have this freedom in God, we can't shove it down people's face. Um, in verse 5, it says, One person regards one day above another, regards another day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. The, the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, they um, regard the Sabbath and they believe that they should worship on the Sabbath. It becomes a sin when they try to force us to worship on the Sabbath. But we regard Sunday, the Lord's Day, when he rose from the grave. So we shouldn't make a big deal about that, right? In verse 6, he says, um, it says, Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes one day observes it for the Lord. But he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For no one... No, no, not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. Why? We live for Christ and we live for others. Verse 8, for if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whatever we live, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, listen to this, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. The Pharisees and Sadducees were arguing about resurrection and death. Some believed in resurrection, some didn't. But the point was, stop arguing about it. You know what? The Lord will let us know. If you don't understand Scripture 100%, God will reveal it to us. He knows we're not Him. We're not going to understand 100% all the time. Though as a pastor, I, I feel like I can be asked a question about anything in the Bible, any book, any passage. I should be able to give you an interpretation of that based on my studies. And if I haven't studied, I don't, des I don't deserve to be a pastor because I don't even know what I'm talking about then, right? And so here he goes on to say, um, verse 10, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, 
Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, he says in verse 12, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this. Look, even though he says you can do what you want to do, he says, don't judge each other. But in the end, one of you is going to have to take the higher road. Why? Look what he says in verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But everybody say but again. But rather determine this not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, it says. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Did you get that? If what you're eating or drinking is causing your brother to be offended and get in his feelings, just don't do it. Because you're already seeing they're weak in the faith. They're not mature yet. You take the high road. It's a command. It's not you do you and let them do them. You're like, oh, bro, you weak. Shh. Go about yourself, man. Shh. Go about your man. Look what he's going to say next. Look at this. It says, for if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. But check this part out. Part B of verse 15 of Romans 14. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Don't be, don't be ruining an opportunity for you to minister. You're there to minister to him, not to tell him what freedoms and liberties you got. Your job is to take him or her to Christ. Don't destroy the work. If this is a non-believer, you're going to destroy the work by arguing, oh, bro, don't come to me with all of that. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I ain't bound by this no more. Then just say, okay, bro, if it offends you, I'm not going to do it. There. But when you're on your own in secret, you could go ahead and do it. Your job is not to destroy what, the work that Christ is doing. That's our job. Amen? Man, that's powerful. Do not destroy with your food or your drink or with whatever you want to do. Don't destroy him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. If whatever you're doing, it might be good for you, don't let it be spoken of as evil. Just don't do it. Say, okay, bro, you know what? If it offends you, I love you. I respect you. I'm not going to do it. I do, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. For the sake of what? Love and peace. Amen. And for the sake of your brother's, your neighbor's good, not just your own. He says here, for in verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The whole goal is to be at peace. And your happiness doesn't come from what you're free to do. Your happiness and joy comes from the Holy Ghost in you. So if even if you're not able to do something or you know what, someone ministers you and preaches to you not to do something, that something shouldn't be where your joy and happiness comes from anyway. Don't just say, oh, forget y'all, I'm just going to do it. Your real joy and happiness should come from the Holy Ghost. Amen. In verse um, 18, he says, For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So what are we doing when we're looking at and considering the, the weaknesses of others? We're serving Christ. <clears throat> Why? Because we're able then to give them more of Christ. We're not to give them more of what we want to do. We're to give them more of what the Word of God wants us to do in order to lead them to Christ. And he says here in verse 19, So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food or anything. Don't tear down what God's doing to a person. God may be working on an atheist or someone. You know, like the song says, even when I don't see it, he's working. Don't get all bold and arrogant with atheists when they attack you or non-believers. Take it like a man. Take it like a strong Christian woman. Why? For the sake of Christ. You might, if you can handle it, they'll see that you're not shaken and they may listen to you. Amen. You might have an opportunity to minister to Christ. It says here <clears throat> in verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food, it says. And then it says here, um, all things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. So if it's going to cause offense, don't do it. It's evil for this person. Once and for all, listen to the word of God. Verse 21. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Look at that. It is good not to do something that causes your brother to stumble. If what you're doing is going to cause your brother to stumble, then don't do it. 
Don't do it, man. Don't do it. If, if drinking a glass of wine, just because you're free to do it, don't do it if it causes your brother who's struggling to go into AA and, and, and that's how he lost his family. And now he's on, you know, probation or parole because he just got out of prison for DWI. Man, don't do it. Look what it says. It is, a, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Verse 23, 22. The, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Wow, that's, that's some good stuff there. Because we need to understand what he's saying here. I mean, he's saying we got freedoms to do anything. But just because we got these freedoms, there are boundaries. The boundary is don't offend anyone else. Speaking of boundaries, let me just go ahead and give the answer to what my conviction is based on the gospel. I believe that as a Christian, is it okay for a Christian? Is it okay for a Christian? Not a, not one who already has tattoos because God accepts us the way we are, but is it okay for a new Christian or a Christian who's born again or someone who's got tattoos to keep piling them on or to get more tattoos? You know what the answer is? It's okay for them. It's, it's between them. And that's okay for them. Now, there are some things that just because you're free, you're not okay to do. Like, just uh, it's it's not the pastor's business or the church's business, what a husband and wife do in the room, but there are boundaries. They can do whatever they want to as long as they're in agreement. The husband can't force his wife to do something sexually, and the wife can't vice versa force her husband. Nor is there's a boundary. Nor are they allowed to bring animals into the picture. That's gross. That's biblical. You can't do that. Yes, it's Old Testament, but even in New Testament, that's an abomination. It's ungodly. You can't do things like that or bringing in another woman or another man, you know, in, in these situations. But speaking of these boundaries, I want to go a little further because, as I said, look, there's no way that I could be against someone having a tattoo. But the person who's getting the tattoo, you need to consider, will it be an offense to somebody? What if you're the best children's minister in the church and you're tatted and we get four or five new families who come in who are really seeking God? And they got little children. And you're the best children's teacher. We got your charisma, your personality, everything. But these people are offended by people with tattoos. They're, what do you expect? They're new Christians. We need to build them up and lead them more to Christ. We can't just say, well, forget them. Go somewhere else. You see what I'm saying? It could be a stumbling block to somebody. The difference between food and wine and other things is that you can put that aside. If you get a tattoo, my brother and sister, you can't take it off. You could cover it up. Yeah, you could cover it up. You sure can. So consider maybe if you get one where you put it, right? But I, as a pastor, Twin City as a church, we don't look down on people who have tattoos, and we don't look down on people who may choose to get one. But we do teach the truth. We teach the gospel, and the gospel says you must consider others. You don't know if in the future God wants to use you with somebody the amount of tattoos you got or where you got them may be an offense to a brother, just like food or drink will be an offense. You don't live for yourself no more, brother and sister. You live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is my conviction. I've cried over this. I've prayed over this. I've wrestled with this over, over and over. But the scripture is clear that God gives us liberties and freedoms as long as it is across the line in the boundary. And that boundary could be as long as it doesn't offend anyone. But once you start thinking, I'm going to do me, you do you, I do me, you're not living for the sake of others. You're not living to be a fellow partaker of the gospel. You're now becoming a stumbling block and an offense to someone who's new and immature or doesn't lack any understanding and is ignorant to the freedoms you got. So take the higher road. Pray about this. It may be different for you depending on what church, culture, and environment you're around. The Word of God here is clear and specific. I agree and say that you have that freedom. But really use, use some great wisdom. And we'll see that in a second. Because speaking of tattoos, there is another boundary. And this boundary is here. This is where the boundary is. And I want you to pay close attention to where this boundary is. Because it's going to make a... A world of difference 
that even though I said what I said about my perspective about tattoos, there are still boundaries. Here's a boundary for us. Let's consider this. And let's get very specific. Your age. Let's say Pastor Chris said, you know, that it's okay for us to get a tattoo. I didn't say that 100% that it's okay for everybody. I said that I think the scripture gives room because of the freedoms that we have under the grace of God. We no longer are under the law. We're under the grace of God. But we shouldn't allow our freedoms. As Paul says in Romans 6, in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning just because God is good and he's merciful and gracious and will forgive us? May we never do that. Jesus died because of our sin. We shouldn't sin no more. It was, it was horrible what he had to go through because we sinned. So just because God is forgiving doesn't mean we need to continue to sin is what he's saying. So just because we got freedoms to do things, we shouldn't do them just because we got these freedoms. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying because I think teaching like this leaves room for self-conviction and self-reflection without me having to get fully and completely in someone's business. I'm not called to get in someone's business. I'm called to correct people. When someone is arguing in a wrong way about something, we need to correct. We don't judge. The word, the word judge means to correct, and it also means to condemn. We're not called to condemn people. That means to say they're going to hell. We don't do that, but we do. We are called to give righteous judgment. Righteous judgment says that we judge rightly on how you know we operate as children of God. Now, speaking of these boundaries, coming back to this because a young person who's living with his parents still and is under the authority as Peter teaches we're in the Bible study um, speaking of first Peter we're in chapter 3 we've read chapter 1 and 2 already um, verse by verse studying the word of God and in there Peter says in verse 13 of first Peter chapter 2 he says that we are to submit ourselves to every human institution and government for the Lord's sake that means we submit to the government as long as it doesn't interfere with worshiping and honoring God, as long as it doesn't interfere with God's work. So if anything I'm doing is going to interfere with God's work, then guess what? I don't do it because I could cause an offense. The whole objective is to lead people to Christ and to build the people of Christ up. Amen. So looking at this in Ephesians chapter six, verse one and two, here's what I want you to see. And I think it's very clear, very specific for those who are under the authority of their parents. The word of God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So even if you said, Pastor Chris said this about tattoos and this church and this pastor, this TikTok teacher, and yada, yada, yada. You know what? You want to live for the Lord? The main objective is to honor God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, even if you're a young person. Why? Because you're a child of God now. You don't belong to yourself. Even you don't belong to yourself. And especially when we're talking about such a topic as tattoos, you are to obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. Did you see that? So there's a boundary for a young person who says, oh, there's freedom to do this and freedom to do that. There's a boundary. For the young person, but you know what? Don't cross that boundary. There's liberties and freedoms, but don't cross those boundaries for the sake of love and for not destroying the work of Jesus Christ. The opportunity to not offend someone and to witness to someone. Now, um, I'll say this. If anyone has an issue with anything that you've heard me say today, on behalf of the Word of God as a representative of Jesus Christ, I don't always represent him 100 because I'm human. I try to, I strive to, but this is the way we teach within the confines of the body of Christ at our local church, at Twin City Community Church, a position as a pastor that I, I respect very much and I, 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 I honor and I cherish because I would never want to lead anyone astray because everyone who's coming to God is for his glory and for his namesake. So I don't ever want to get in the way of misleading someone. But if you have a problem or a concern about what I've taught today, if you're a pastor friend of mine and you disagree with me, or if you are um, a person who even comes to Twin City Community Church and now you got 
uh, situation you want to talk to me about. That's the good thing about Twin City Community Church. You know what we do? We talk with each other about everything. But let me close with this. It says in James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on is it okay for a Christian to get a tattoo? I believe the Holy Spirit and the conviction that he's given me and the truth in his God's word leads us to consider that though we have freedoms to do things, we must consider others more highly than ourselves. that we would offend no one from coming to Christ or being built up in Christ. Amen. I hope you come back and enjoy our other podcast. This was our first one. And I pray that God continues to bless not only the Twin City Community Church family, but also all of you brothers and sisters in Christ and those who may not know the Lord. I pray that you would take the time to reach out to God for he's desiring to have a relationship with you in the name of Jesus Christ. So I just want to pray, Father, for those who don't know you, I pray that they would call out to you, that they would turn from their sins and see that you are merciful and gracious and that you give us freedoms but that we would consider you above all else and in others, Lord God, more than ourselves. But that if they don't know you, that those who don't know you, after repenting, that they would believe that they need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior, and that they would believe that he came and lived the perfect life that they couldn't live, and he died the death that they should have died, and that he was buried and rose again in their place. And because he rose, that they can now rise, and that they will be free. Father, I thank you that you are hearing their prayer right there where they're at right now. And I pray in the name of Jesus that if you are touched or moved by um, this message, I pray that you would leave a comment and that you would go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Twin City Community Church, Texas. We give you um, uh, an opportunity to see everything else that we have. So for now, God bless you. On behalf of Twin City Community Church and me, Pastor Chris Rodriguez, have a wonderful and blessed rest of your day, rest of your week in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.